Lord Jesus, in the moments that we just we, we spend and we open your word, we want to be very aware that you have longed to speak to us and to continue to put hope and love deep into our hearts. And so we want to be aware that this is not just another moment for you. This is not another Vespers. This is, the, this is a, a, a date in, in your calendar book that you have been looking forward to. And so as we spend these last moments with you and, and bid farewell to the sacred hours of Sabbath, we pray that our hearts would hear the echoes of heaven. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Isaiah chapter 66. Your Bibles, Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66 speaks of the new heavens and the new earth. Isaiah, as you know, the book of Isaiah parallels Scripture, 66 chapters, 66 books, the major division coming in the chapters of Isaiah, right where the, chap right where the books of the Old and New Testament are divided. The, the journey of Isaiah culminates in the language of the apocalypse, Revelation, this final chapter speaks of the new heavens and the new earth that Revelation speak of. And so very much it's a, it's a mini Bible, as it were, in the, in the book of Isaiah. As the new heavens, verse 22, and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. It's talking about in eternity here, the endurance, they will last forever. From one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. Now, what, uh, what, is, what does that have to do with our, our, our theme of the altar? You, you, you just catch it right here, that the altar doesn't stop on this earth. The idea of coming down and having time with God, personal time, family time, corporate time, extends through eternity. As the new heavens and the new earth will endure before me, says God, so you will continue to come before me and you will worship. You will bow down before me. Your time with Jesus is, is not to prepare you for eternity in the sense that if you do this, you will then graduate for eternity. It actually prepares you for eternity in the sense that it is what happens for eternity. Now, by no means, for those of us, <laughs> because as much as we, as we try, we often sometimes cycle back to the cartoonist pictures of what happens in heaven. We'll be playing the harp and sitting on clouds, and it will just be one long worship service, which for, for very few of us sounds attractive. And the adults are just ones that we don't admit that anymore. But you talk to a group of young people or children about, whoa, that just doesn't sound it. I don't believe that this is that this is that heaven is one continual worship service. In fact, the fact that the Bible points out that there will be Sabbath experience and new moon experience speaks to the fact that there will be a plethora of other experiences, right? The fact that we will come down and worship and that we will have time set aside for Sabbath and sacred worship speaks to the fact that heaven will be full of, and the new earth will be full of much else. I kind of think in my own sanctified imagination that when we, we want to ask God, those of us from Colorado, right, if skiing isn't in heaven, do I really want to go there? And some of us will wrestle with, well, if, if this, what about this game? What? I believe that God in heaven will come to say, oh, guys, I know, I know, you love soccer, you love shooting the bass, let me show you something that is just far beyond that. Like, like he'll take it to the next level for those skiers. Oh, you, 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 you just dine to ski. Let me show you something that satisfies that part of your, your life, but just so much more, right? That's kind of the, the whole conversation of, well, will there be family or marriage in heaven? 
Well, that's a great conversation. <laughs> well, here's heaven. And then there will become these Sabbaths and the new moons. Maybe you've done a study on the new moons. I've, I've been very interested in what new moons are because here they're listed as coming alongside the Sabbath experience in heaven. It's not just, it's not just something referenced in the Old Testament as something that they did or have done, but it's something that's pointed forward to. And so if you understand, and, and no doubt some of you have done the study on the new moons, the new moons is, is simply uh, a non-sacred assembly, uh, kind of like a Thanksgiving would be, where you come together and you fellowship and you eat and, and maybe you play, but it's a non-sacred event. So just picture this in heaven. Here, God's, God says through the prophet Isaiah, as he closes off his book, hey, this heaven and earth is going to last forever, and there are going to be gatherings for eternity, new moons, non-sacred events, like Thanksgiving celebrations, where all of heaven gather, and all of creation gather. And, and it's not a worship. So, well, will, will there be worship? Will there be? Yes, there will be Thanksgiving to God. But it's a non-sacred event, as it were. If you can be in God's presence in a non-sacred event. You understand that words fail here. But it's like a Thanksgiving experience where you gather and you celebrate and you spend time together and you community together. Maybe you play games. Maybe that's when heaven says, hey, we want to show you something else that you've never experienced. We want to show you a, a game, a group game. Come on, group activity, right? But then the Sabbath comes. The Sabbath comes. And from one Sabbath to another, all of mankind, all of us will come and will worship. Well, I don't know. Let your just imagination run wild on, on, on what the preaching lineup in heaven could be or what the musical lineup in heaven could be. But here's what I know is that you, we tend to, while, while I, I think that God and the angels certainly will, will outdo all of us, some of us have ha, kind of think back to other eras of time. Well, if we, you know, if we, Paul will no doubt get to preach, and, and Daniel, well, he'll, he'll be way before any of us to share his story. But the reality is that the Pauls and the Daniels were dying to live in our day. They wanted to be the final generation that finished the work and, and saw the final events of earth's history and welcomed what Daniel saw through vision, what Paul preached about. They had to go to their grave, never having seen. These men and these women longed for the opportunity to be in the day that we are. So who do you think they want to hear from first? When we get to heaven... And you go, you get directions to Daniel's mansion, and you get there. Let me tell you, he won't be there. Because he will have already gotten directions to your mansion to come talk to you. He wants to find out what it was like to live in the, in the time that he only saw through vision. And so I don't know who, who will get to share first their stories and who will get to do the features in heaven or, or share their testimonies. But this I know that... The, that heaven is going to be very interested in your story, in my story, in our story, because we are able, we are privileged, beloved, we are privileged to live in the closing scenes of earth's history. And, and this, is, this is that, this is that uh, sports analogy, if that's what you connect with, this is that, those last couple of minutes when, when the coach puts in people with unique gifts and stories and abilities so that they can win the game. It's not a comparison at all, but it's saying that you, you are here to be a Daniel and an Esther and a Paul. You're here for that reason. So in heaven, we'll get through the stories and, and hear the sermons. No doubt. No doubt, those have already been planned. 
And that Sabbath experience, intentionality, God is already planning for those first Sabbaths in heaven, what it will look like and what it will do. The most known verse in Scripture, in fact, it's so known that you just stay right here in Isaiah 66 and turn in your mind to John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is God pouring out everything he has for us to be part of finishing the work. There's a there's an interesting little twist on John 3.16. It's not a twist at all. It's just, it's just a flushing out of what Jesus meant. You remember that Jesus, when he, when he said, when he, when he said, for God so loved the world, he's talking, he's talking in the context to, to just one person. He's just talking. He's, he's explaining. The, the love of God for the world to, to save someone. I kind of picture him on a, on a moss-covered stone bench. I don't know where that came from, but that's what I picture. A moss-covered stone bench, and it's dark. And he says, for God so loved the world. The, the term he uses, the Greek word, cosmos, which we're familiar with, but cosmos... It, it does mean the world. It's, it's, a, it's a good translation, except it's just short. It's just a little bit short. Because in, in the Greek understanding of cosmos, cosmos is the context in which you use it. You can use world in the context of just one other person. You can say things like, you mean the cosmos to me. Just one person. You can speak to a community of people and say, you're, you're everything to me. You're the world to me. Or you can speak to quite literally the entire world and even the universe. The cosmos is not just the planet, but it's the universe. And so what Jesus is saying here is the one person and the universe, whatever context you're, you're in. Another prophet reflecting on this very same question, says, you're as if there was no other that ever existed. You're it. You're the world. For God so loved the cosmos, you're the cosmos. Aquanetta, you're the cosmos. To God, you're, you're the world to him. That's you. It also means the Centerville Church. That's the world to God. It means, of course, Ohio, this country and every country, but it doesn't stop on this planet. It means the world. We mean the world. It means the universe, rather. It just depends on the context you use it in. And so the message of John 3.16 is no matter, no matter how many of us are gathered, we're everything to heaven. It reminds me of a situation my father found himself in when I was a total miracle story. I'll have to tell you sometime. It's, um, my father was diagnosed with cancer, a cancer that was growing behind his eye. Over the course of years, he had lost sight in one of his eyes and didn't know it. We had this strange occurrence that happened that moved us to California from Oregon, and we land in California, and they make him get a new driver's license, and, and uh, the little... Uh, little uh, binoculars there that blinky lights and all that kind of stuff. And so they tell him, hey, uh, tell us when you see the blink light on the right, and he, and he never sees it. And then to find out he's 100% blind in one eye and never knew it. It just happened so slowly. It was part of then a, a project to, uh, where they removed his eye and gave him a glass eye to remove the cancer. That... And so my, my father, who has... Uh, who has, in his later years, after being in the military and the fire department, has served as, a, as an athletic referee for the 
public school system in the state of Oregon. He's running the basketball court with one eye, and, uh, and I'll at times go and sit in the, in, to just spend time with him, I'll sit in these games of teams I have no connection with, I'm just there to support my dad, next to parents who are yelling at the ref, if you've ever been to a game, about how he doesn't have two eyes. What's wrong with you, ref? Don't you have two eyes? Can't you see what's going on? And I just want to turn to them without connecting myself to him and say, yeah, I, it's true, he only has one eye. But I, I don't because it wouldn't make me a very popular person. Uh, but my father has only one eye. You, you don't know it immediately because he has the glass eye. Well, uh, they, they lived for, until they downsized to 17 acres, they lived on, on 150 acres in an old farmhouse that had been uh, remodeled a bit, and except for the sink. The sink was still an old sink, an old bowl with a hole at the bottom. It didn't have a stopper. It didn't have a plug. And every once in a while, my dad would, would pop out his eye and uh, rinse it off. Stop, it's my story. <laughs> and uh, one, one day, he's, he pops his eye out and rinses it off. And it, it makes one circle around the, the drain as it slips out of his hands, one circle around the drain, and then it's gone. Well, you can't, I mean, maybe you've seen people without an eye in their socket, it's, it can be distracting. And certainly it would be distracting if he were to go referee a sports game. And so he needs that eye. So just the ball, I mean, it's, it doesn't serve anything besides. And so uh, he, he's hope, he hopes, you know, the plumbing has caught it. Is there that, whatever that trap is, that little loop that goes underneath your sink that goes up and goes down and around and, uh, what trap? A day trap, a J trap, a P trap, J trap, P trap. It kind of depends on what configuration yours is. <laughs> Could be a Z trap. I don't know. But it's not there. It's just straight plumbing. Ah, it's an old. It's an old configuration. So they they take out the plumbing all the way underneath the house, section by section, and then they get to the yard where it goes underneath the ground, and, and then they dig six feet at a time. They're digging out the, the plumbing, hoping that somewhere that, that eye is, is stalled up. They dig all the way across the yard to the septic tank. What do you do? Well, they called the... Called the the, the honey, I think they call it the honey wagon, right? Yeah, the honey wagon. And they put a filter on the end of the hose and begin to work on emptying the tank. And sure enough, the very bottom, everything else cleaned up, there's the eye. He wrestled with it. How clean does clean get? Well, the end of the story is, is it, it never went back in his head. It, uh, he ended up calling as a veteran. He, he called the VA and, and asked them you know, how, how often or, or what happens if this were to happen. They said, oh, oh, you're, you're a good 12 months overdue for your, I guess they, uh, they just send you a new eye every installment. They said, don't put that thing back in. We're shipping you a new one. Uh, so they shipped him a new one, and, and now he's on a schedule where he can have a little collection of eyes. But here's the takeaway. Here's the takeaway from John 3.16 and Isaiah 66. This idea of, of gathering in heaven, this is not an abstract. This is as real as we're sitting here tonight, beloved. One day we will gather together at the eve of a Sabbath in heaven. And we'll, we'll be us. We're not going to be little people on harps. I do want to play a harp in heaven. I think that would be really cool. But we'll be in heaven, and we'll be us, except all of these people. Isaiah himself will be there, and Jesus, of course. 
and they will be there, and we will be worshiping and closing the Sabbath together. And we will be there because of one reason. One reason. Now catch this. We're going back to the eyeball. Because Jesus relentlessly pursued you. And he found you at the very bottom of the tank. But it didn't matter. You were precious to him and worth it. And that's going to be all of our stories. We were at the bottom of the tank. And Jesus went all the way. He didn't stop even when he got to the tank. He kept coming after us and coming after us and coming after us. And he's doing that for your children. He's doing that for your parents and your siblings. I have two sisters that every night I bow on my knees and plead for their salvation. God's not done with them yet. But he's going to relentlessly pursue because God so loved the cosmos. And the cosmos were you and you, your children, the Centerville Church, the state of Ohio, and beyond. Lord Jesus, we're looking forward to Sabbath and eternity. Ah, we're looking forward to Sabbath and the new moons. All of these gatherings. There will be places set aside just for us. And it will all be made possible because Jesus relentlessly pursued us. Never gave up. Even when it was repulsive, and we hid from him in the deepest, darkest places of our own hearts. He came after us. And one day, we will give face to face all the honor and the glory and the praise. Because you alone are worthy to receive it. And so let it be, Jesus, that you accept our acknowledgement of the work that you are doing and that you will do and the work you will finish in our lives. In the name of Jesus.